The Cavalcade of America. America, the land of opportunity. The truth of this phrase is borne out time and time again by the stories in the Cavalcade of America presented by DuPont each week at this time. And it is fitting that DuPont should present a message of opportunity because the chemist in his laboratory today stands at the threshold of opportunity. Opportunity to perform new services for mankind, to make life easier, safer, and happier. It is our privilege on these radio programs to tell you something of the chemist's work and to illustrate the meaning of the DuPont chemist creed, better things for a better living through chemistry. The DuPont Cavalcade Orchestra rings up the curtain with a special arrangement of a popular favorite, Sylvia, by the well-known American composer, Oli Speak. Even as a young country just beginning to be settled, America came to be known as a land of opportunity. Thousands of men have shown the energy and intelligence to find what opportunity America has held for them. It is an afternoon in 1723. 
A few miles west of Burlington, New Jersey, on a road bordering the riverbank, a farm cart pulls up beside a young man who is walking by the roadside. The farmer driving hails the stranger. Whoa, whoa now, ho. Hey, Lap. Want to ride? Most certainly, sir. If you can take a passenger. Yep. Put your foot on the wheel and swing up. Yeah? That's the that's way. Uh, that's the uh, way. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Well, you're pretty active for a city lad. Get up. What? How did you know I was from the city? Oh, tell it by your talk. Couldn't tell it by your looks for certain. <laughs> See, your fare covered up with New Jersey dust. I know that, sir. It seems either to rain all the time in this colony or else to be very dusty. Oh, no. It ain't no different from other colonies. Where are you from? Boston, sir. My name is Benjamin Franklin. Ben Franklin, huh? Well, you've got a grown-up manner on you for a lad. You don't look to be no more than 16. 70. Yeah. Looking for work? Yes. But not in New Jersey. In Philadelphia. I know of a position to be had there in a printing shop. You're, you're walking to Philadelphia? <laughs> well, lad, you can't get down them shoes. Another mile and you'll be barefoot. Oh, I'll get there. Never fear. Because I've gone too far to turn back. Like Caesar, I have burned my bridges behind me. Yeah. Like who? Say, lad, you ain't been burning bridges in New Jersey, have you? Oh, <laughs> me, sir. What? I mean, I can't stop with opportunity but 40 miles away. Oh. How much money have you? If it ain't easy to find work. So wait until I see. Here. Here's my treasury. Hmm. Spanish dollar and a copper shilling. <laughs> my conscience, lad. Look, sir. Look back of us to the curve of the river. A boat rose up very fast. Aye, aye. Most likely farm folks row into the market in Philadelphia. Well, wait, please. Hold your horse. Let me down. Why, lad? Why? That, that's a private boat. Regular boat ain't for sad me. I can jump down, sir. Well, all right. Whoa, ho, now, ho. There, there, don't you see? The boat is steering unevenly. There's one, two, three, four, ten oars on the port side, and one, two, six, nine on the starboard. They must have an extra oar aboard, and they need someone to use it. Ahoy there! Ahoy! Ahoy there! What do you want? Where does your boat go? Philadelphia! If you need another oar, I'll row. Goodbye, right, sir. Thank you for All the ride right. in your cart. If I were a believer in omens, I should say that my sighting this boat was That's a good right, one. Yeah, yes, it is, for certain. Thank you again for the help. Up. All right. Hurry, right, boys, step in. I'll take your bundle aboard first. Here you are, sir. Up. All right. Now step careful, boys. Look out, now don't slip. Thank you. I'm aboard. All right, give him his oars. All right. Put her up. All clear. All clear, sir. Now, pull away together. Come on. One, two, three. Four. Goodbye, sir. Four. Well, good luck to you, son. You're a right smart lad. Benjamin Franklin, as a young man, arrived in Philadelphia with one Spanish dollar and a shilling. In 20 years, he had added to that slim store his own printing shop and bookshop, his own newspaper, and the famous Poor Richard's Almanac. For Philadelphia, he initiated projects that gave her a city police, paved and lighted streets, a circulating library, the American Philosophical Society, a hospital, and a school that later became the University of Pennsylvania. But as a middle-aged man, Franklin had still not forgotten his interest in new opportunities. One evening in 1748 at the Franklin home, Mr. Franklin, in his electrical laboratory, talks with Mr. David Hall. If it please you, Mr. Hall, we will sign the papers tomorrow, and you may henceforth call my business half your own. I shall be delighted, Mr. Franklin. Now that this bargain is struck, will you satisfy my curiosity in telling me why you have done it? No, there is no mystery, sir. I fall in love with science. Hmm. Let me show you my electrical bottle and its monstrous spark. Well, this. You insist, there sir. is none like it in America. Uh, Debbie. Debbie. What is it, Benjamin? Ah, oh, good evening, Mr. Hall. Good evening, Mrs. Franklin. Uh, Debbie, will you help me move these jars to the table where the bottle lies? Another experiment. Uh, this goes on all day, Mr. Hall. We have as many electrical shocks to offer in this house as the wizards at a country fair. <laughs> I hope I'm more scientific than a strolling magician, Debbie. Mm -hmm. And what of interest have you found, sir? The repulsions and attractions of pointed bodies for electricity 
of positive and negative charging, and of my belief that lightning is not but electricity. Lightning, then? But lightning is fire from the stars. <laughs> well, whatever it is, I'm content to remain with the printing business. Well, I shall have no regrets, I am certain. All ready. Blow out the candle, Debbie. I have the bottle ready for the charging. You cannot see, Mr. Hall, but I connect wires, and now... What? Why, it's amazing. So brilliant. The light in the bottle. It's beautiful, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It is more than beautiful, Debbie. It's useful, too, I'm sure of it. And it offers to some brave searcher a chance to find how to use it. Franklin's fame and political standing in Europe made him the logical ambassador of the colonies when they found themselves facing perilous times. It is 1778 in Paris. The American delegation sent to France to enlist help in the struggle for independence is about to be presented at court. In a room in Paris set aside for them, Franklin, his colleagues, and the court barber have an anxious consultation. <sighs> Mr. Franklin, this is a tragedy. On the day of all days, when we are to seek the aid of the French court. Mr. Franklin, the wig, it will not fit you. I tried this way, I tried that way, no matter well, how I tried. since there is no help for it, gentlemen, and my wig will not fit me, we may better look for a way to mend matters than to grieve over them. Well, I believe you scarcely see the gravity of our plight, sir. Here's a dean and I are dressed in court costume. But you, you are the chief American delegate to Louis XVI. You're wearing that plain brown suit and... Without a wig... Uh, Monsieur Le Barber, uh, would it not be better if, instead of wearing a ridiculous wig, I went without one? You can't can be that too, you, you dare not challenge French tradition, Mr. Franklin. Mm, I should not challenge French tradition. I should merely assert the existence of an American tradition for going without wigs. Oh, mon Dieu, mon Dieu, what a problem. I am the court barber. It will all fall on me. I will be the man who ruined the friendship of nations. My customers will leave me. Oh, no, not sir. necessarily, sir. Uh, once, many years ago, I entered Philadelphia most informally with my pockets stuffed with soiled linen and munching a roll as I walked. A lady noticed my appearance and laughed. Yet she later married me. Well, I would remind you, sir, that Marie Antoinette's standards in dress are not those of Philadelphia. No. But dwelling on that trivial matter has given me time for my decision. I shall go as I am. Oh, but you can't yeah. do that. I shall uh, wear this plain brown suit and my own hair. Of course, the brow is noble and the locks stately and long. I know you better, sir, than to try to dissuade you. Though I remind you again that you are an ambassador from America. Aye. Now I bethought me of another unsuitable item of dress. This sword. You go like a plain gentleman? Swordless? A plain and democratic gentleman. If the carriage waits... Let us leave for by saying. A short time later at Versailles, a huge crowd packs the shady alleys in the courtyard and presses near the wide stairways. As Benjamin Franklin and his four delegates walk into the palace, a drum corps stands at attention. The drums roll, the palace flag is dipped, and long files of troops present arms. The doors to the king's apartment swing open. And to the waiting courtiers, the major of the Swiss Guard calls... Les ambassadeurs de très états-unis. Welcome to Versailles, Monsieur Franklin. Your Majesty... I present my credentials and my embassy from the United States of America. I pray you make it known to your people that I have been most satisfied with your conduct during your sojourn in my realm. Please assure your Congress of my friendship. I thank you, sire. My countrymen will enjoy, rejoice greatly in this news that our new nation has been recognized in Europe. Benjamin Franklin became the idol of France and the skillful builder of his country's diplomatic fortune. As a young man in his middle age and as an old man tired by his strenuous life, he was always alert to grasp an opportunity.
The second episode in this evening's Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont, brings us up to the 1800s and tells the story of another famous American who appreciated the possibilities of an opportunity. It is the 4th of July, 1862. In a small, modest home in Portland, Maine, Mrs. Curtis hears her 12-year-old son, Cyrus, calling. Ma! Oh, Ma! Yes, Cy, what is it? Ma, Will Dalton's out front and he says I can come to the 8th grade picnic if I bring some fireworks with me. Could I please have 15 cents? Cyrus, I've tried to explain to you. We haven't any spare money as the neighbors have. We have enough to live on. But there is no money for picnics and fireworks. But, oh, I do hate to have you miss all your good times. Oh, Mother, I don't care about picnics as much as all that. Don't you worry. Forget about the money. Will, hurry up, Cy. I'm coming. Hey, hey, Will, you go on in the picnic. I don't know as I'll get there because i got to earn some money. Earn some? How are you going to earn money on the 4th of July? Let's cross the street. I got some capital of my own, but I got to increase it. How much you got? Is that it? Three cents. Portland, Portland, I want to talk Portland, to this fellow who's selling newspapers. Yeah, paper. Hey, mister! Portland. Mister! Buy a paper, young fella. All about the big 4th of July parade. Uh, how many papers you got left there? Three. Take your pick. Hey, you'll never sell those papers now. It's getting late in the day. Most everyone's out driving or something. Oh, you think you're telling me something? I've been peddling this neighborhood an hour without a sale. Tell you what, I'll buy your three papers for three cents. Three cents, huh? Well, oh, sure, take them. Give me the cash. Thanks. Didn't you hear him say he'd been peddling an hour with no luck? Well, I'll peddle two hours, as long as I have to. Because I'm going to work regularly from now on and help my family. I'll figure the sooner you start, the farther you go. So I'm starting now. Portland Tribune! Portland Tribune! <laughs> Young Cyrus H.K. Curtis, looking about for any means to make money for his 4th of July fireworks, got his first taste of newspaper business. Through peddling papers and clerking in a department store, he had saved enough money to start two newspapers of his own. But he lost both his printing plants in fire. To the shop of his kindly old Scotch printer, W.C. Allen, to whom he owed a large bill, Cyrus brings his fiancée, Louise Knapp. You and Miss Knapp are going to be married, Cyrus. Well, I congratulate both of you. Well, thank you, Miss Allen. But we felt that we we had to have a talk with you first. Cyrus says he owes you a great deal of money for a printing bill. Aye, $800. But I have perfect confidence in his ability to pay me back someday. Well, that's kind of you, Miss Allen. But what I have to admit is that right now I, I haven't any money at all, except what I make from one week to the next. Louise is willing to chance it with me and get married, but I thought we should explain this matter to... To my largest creditor. You had more real luck than any man would normally expect. Well, to tell the truth, Mr. Allen, I've, I've developed a great longing to start once again in Philadelphia this time. I believe Cy has been reading Benjamin Franklin's autobiography, and he went from Boston to Philadelphia. Well, I know of an opening there, but you spent so much money printing the people's ledger for me. I was afraid you'd say I should stick it out here. No. No, Cyrus. Take your chance when you see it. Do the best you can. Pay me what you can, and pay the rest when you can. Thank you, Mr. Allen. You've given me spunk to go on with this scheme, and I'll never forget it. Cyrus Curtis and Louise Knapp married on the proverbial shoestring. A few years later in Philadelphia, where young Curtis is publisher of a struggling little paper, The Tribune and Farmer, at his home... Curtis is having a talk with his editor, Thomas Meehan. I can't understand why we don't do better, Mr. Curtis. Neither do I, Miss Meehan. But we must figure out a reason soon. I I have a wife to think of. I can't make her suffer actual privation while every cent I have goes into a dead magazine. It seems to me that the Tribune and Farmer is well written, useful, dignified. I know my articles on agriculture are scientific and up to date. Oh, sorry. Hi, dear. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know you were busy. How do you do, Mr. Meehan? How do you do, Mrs. Curry? I see you're reading the Tribune and Farmer as one of our little jokes, isn't it? Well, no, it, it wasn't that. I uh, I was laughing at Cy's woman page. Oh. Well, that's exactly what struck you so funny, Louise. Well, I don't want to hurt your feelings, Cy, but... Well, look at this. 
economical dinners. Yes. And it advises a huge roast of beef for four people and a cake that takes 12 eggs. Where in the world do you get these recipes? Why, I, I get them out of an old cookbook. Well, then you ought to pick them with more care, dear. Why, suppose some young bride should try to use one. Anything else wrong with the page, Louise? Well, nearly everything. Nearly everything. Well, now, look at this pattern, Si. Would you really want to wear a skirt like that? Well, I... I mean, if you were I. Not in my right mind, no. Say, Louise. Louise, suppose you take charge of our woman's page. Oh, don't be silly. But considering Mrs. Curtis has had no experience, uh, isn't your suggestion a little unusual, Mr. Curtis? Perhaps that's why it's good. Why, why don't you take over our woman's page, Louise? Si, I... I'll be glad to help you in any way I can. Well, now, how would you change this page? Well, well, first, of course, I'd, I'd have recipes that really meant something. Either brand new ones or very economical ones. Or very delicious holiday dishes. And, uh, well, why not have contests on recipes and make women feel that the page was really theirs? And then, well, then I'd have the latest Paris fashions. And I'd always be careful to show how you could copy them right at home. This doesn't sound like one page to me. It sounds like ten pages. Well, why not, me and... It sounds almost like a whole new magazine, and a good one, too. From Louise Curtis's page in the Tribune and Farmer sprang the Ladies' Home Journal, one of the first great financial successes of the publishing business. But Cyrus Curtis's success had come to him in his 30s, and for an active man, this was not enough. In his office, in 1897, Mr. Curtis and an assistant, Mr. Wilton, are talking. This is the best financial statement we ever had, Mr. Curtis. It certainly made the ladies' home journal the envy of the publishing business. Yes, I suppose so. But I believe I liked my magazine better before it learned how to run itself. Oh, well, Mr. Curtis, I meant to ask you. Hmm? I've run across an odd thing in the books. Standing order for $800 to be sent every six months to a man named W.C. Allen. It's marked in payment of a debt. No mention of how much the debt is? No. That's a standing debt, Wilton. That can't ever be paid, no matter how much money is sent for it. I don't quite understand, Mr. Curtis. W.C. Allen is an old man now. He's poor, in bad health, lost his wife. But he gave me money when I badly needed it. So now I pay my debt to him again and again. Because in a way, you see, he invested in me. And I must prove that I was worth it. Mm, I see. Mr. Curtis, there's a Mr. Brady here to see you, a lawyer for the late Alfred Smith of State. There's a surgeon. Uh, show him in, please. Uh, come in, Mr. Brady. Oh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Curtis, I want to take a moment of your time. You were a good friend of my late client, Mr. Smith. About all he left was a little weekly newspaper, the Saturday Evening Post. But in settling his debts, I find I haven't enough left to send the Post to press this week. I wondered if you'd loan the estate enough to help us. Well, um, how much of a plan have you got, Mr. Brady? Well, you've seen it, Mr. Curtis. Worn out presses, battered type. How much of a staff? No staff. We just hire a reporter to clip out the papers. It's all clipping. Now, I'm afraid if you loan any money on this security, Mr. Curtis... You I, buy... I'm not thinking of a loan. I'm thinking of an outright purchase. You surely don't want to buy this little paper, Mr. Curtis. Why, I've seen it. It's Wilton, nothing but... Wilton, the Saturday Evening Post, was the successor to the Pennsylvania Gazette, Benjamin Franklin's newspaper. I knew you were always rather sentimental about it, Mr. Curtis. That's why I came to you. You think the heirs would sell for, say, $1,000? $1,000? Why, I'm sure they would. Could I go out right now, Mr. Curtis, and try to settle it? I'll come back later this afternoon. I'll be waiting, Mr. Brady. Oh, uh, yes? if you've got a copy of the magazine, I'd like to see it. Well, here you are, Mr. Curtis. Last week's copy. And thank you a thousand times. I'll see you later. Mr. Curtis, you wouldn't take this flimsy little rag and publish it along with a ladies' home journal. Indeed, I would. In fact, I'm going to. Wilson, look at that heading. Founded by Benjamin Franklin. This is an opportunity, Wilton, and I'm going to take it. The Saturday Evening Post consolidated the success of Cyrus Curtis, who influenced American publishing more than any man since Benjamin Franklin. In Philadelphia today, there stands a memorial to Benjamin Franklin, largely made possible through the generosity and personal efforts of Cyrus Curtis. This is the Franklin Institute of the State of Pennsylvania, a great scientific and technological museum which has been contributing to the advancement of science for more than a century. The new home of this museum 
to which Mr. Curtis contributed a million dollars, perpetuate Franklin's scientific ideals for the education and inspiration of all men, an active symbol of opportunity in the cavalcade of America. When the name Ben Franklin is mentioned, one thing that immediately comes to mind is printing. For Franklin was America's first great printer and publisher. Thus, it seems fitting to tell a few interesting facts about printing ink, especially since chemistry plays an important part in their manufacture. Most printing inks are composed primarily of varnish in which color is suspended, plus the addition of some drying agent. Unlike dyes, colors used in printing inks are powder-like pigments which do not actually dissolve in water or varnish. These dry colors are ground into varnish on steel roller mills to form smooth inks for various types of printing. The matter of drying is most important in the making of inks, as you may know if you've ever had to get delivery of a printing order in a hurry. Research chemistry, by developing quick drying agents, has been a great help to printers. Without these dryers, High-speed production of modern newspapers and magazines with their tremendous circulation would be impossible. Franklin did practically all of his printing with black ink. He used a simple press and had very few colors to work with. Before chemists went to work on these problems, colors came entirely from natural sources, such as early 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 from natural sources, such as earth and plant and animal extracts. These old-time colors were relatively dull. Chemistry has given us the numerous brilliant colors of today, creating them from coal tar and from various minerals. With these and the vastly improved methods of printing, the printer can now reproduce paintings or natural color photographs in their full beauty. DuPont is an important supplier of color materials to ink manufacturers, and DuPont research chemists are constantly creating improvements in these colors and in other chemical products used in inks. Whenever fine printing delights your eye, you may well be reminded of the phrase that guides the work of DuPont chemists. Better things for better living through chemistry. Railroad builders, stories of the building of the Hussack Tunnel and the first transcontinental railroad will be broadcast next week at this time when DuPont again presents The Cavalcade of America. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. W.A.B.C. New York.